Hello, my name is Mahkoj and today we'll take a look at Optimism, a layer 2 scalability solution built on top of Ethereum network. But first of all, why do we need a scalability solution? The thing is, every single time you are interacting with a blockchain, whether it is sending a transaction to a friend or deploying a smart contract, you are paying to do so. That's what we call a gas fee. The thing is, if too many people are doing that at the same time, this gas price can increase quite significantly. And that's precisely what you can see here on this graph in several occasions. So when this happens, Ethereum network gets congested, leading to poor usability and throughput. And that's precisely where a layer 2 solution steps in. So let's see how it works. Here I brought to you an analogy. So say for example you want to travel from point A to point B and you will be doing that around the time in which many other people are doing that as well. And you are all using individual vehicles. So as you can imagine the path will get congested and it will take you a lot of time and a lot of energy to actually travel the whole path. What a layer 2 will do is take those people on individual vehicles and put them all together inside of a bus. And as you can see here and as you can probably imagine the path will get much clearer and it will take you much less time to actually travel the whole thing. You are still using the same road though, so keep that in mind because that is important. So in a nutshell, that's how layer 2, a roll-up, works. But let's see how this looks like under a blockchain perspective. So let's say now that the individual vehicles are actually the transactions happening on the, on the layer 2, and the bus is actually a batch. So what will happen is that the layer 2 will take all of those transactions, bundle them up inside of a batch, much like a bus, and then deliver this batch to the layer 1. And when you do so, you will be paying the gas price only one time. And this price will be divided across all of the users on, on the layer 2, making it way cheaper. So that's how a layer 2, a rollup, achieves scalability on Ethereum network. So now that we've established that, let's take a look at the most common type of rollup called the optimistic rollup. So here we have pretty much the same picture. So you have the transactions happening on the layer 2, you have them being turned into batches and being delivered to the layer 1. But to understand how optimistic rollups work, we'll have to define two other type of users, the sequencer and the challenger. So the sequencer is the, is the user responsible to actually create the batch and deliver them to the layer one. But why is this called optimistic? This is called optimistic because at an initial point, we assume that the sequencer is telling the truth. So we assume that the data that he is batching and delivering is actually legit and that he's not altering the data to his own benefit. But hey, he could be lying, right? He could be censoring the data so that he will have some benefits on it. So what we can do to attest the veracity of the data is work with another type of user called the challenger. So once the sequencer delivers the batch, a time window is open in which a challenger can submit what we call a fraud proof. And what a fraud proof is, is a piece of technology that can, that can actually attest if the, uh, if the sequencer is telling the truth or not. So at the end of the day, two things can happen. So the sequencer can submit the transactions and he is telling the truth, in fact. So after the time period is closed, the transaction data would just be posted on the layer one with no problem. The second case would be if the sequencer is actually lying. So during that time window, a challenger can compute a fraud proof and actually attest if he's lying or not. And if he is, everything will get reverted and ultimately the reliable transaction data will be posted to the layer one. So either way, the, the veracity is arriving at the layer one and we, are, and we are inheriting the layer one security across the layer two. So now that you know how an optimistic rollup works, let's take a look of, on its main advantage and disadvantage. So. The main advantage of a layer 2 is something we call EVM compatibility. And EVM stands for Ethereum Virtual Machine. So being EVM compatible means in simple terms that you can pretty much take already existing projects on the main chain 
copy and paste their code into the layer 2 and they should work with little to no changes. And on the short term, that is huge because you can onboard a large portion of the projects running on Ethereum into a layer 2, which is much more scalable. A huge disadvantage though is something that we have already established and it is related to the time window necessary for the challengers to submit the fraud proofs. So if you are a user, for example, trying to exit the layer 2, you'll actually have to wait until this challenge window is closed so that you can have your tokens back. So that's a disadvantage, of course. But now let's move on to optimism, the, mo the, the main focus of this video. So optimism, as you should imagine by now, is an optimistic rollup. So everything we've established so far will work here and can be translated into optimism. So let's take a look at its particularities. So as of today, optimism relies on a centralized single sequencer. So this single sequencer will pretty much do the same thing we've already talked about. So provide transaction confirmation, execute the layer two blocks and deliver the transaction history to the layer one. And they are subject to fraud proofs. So that's something they should be aware of. As for the challengers, optimism defines a seven day time window in which they can submit fraud proofs. And actually for optimism, that is called a fraud proof. So that's something you should be aware of when reading their docs. And as for the fees, they are calculated the same way as they are on the main chain, with the main difference, of course, of being much cheaper. But you should expect also a base fee and a priority fee. But hey, this is optimism under its roll-up perspective only. And a blockchain project should be way more than that. So let's take a look at another huge front of optimism's work called Optimism Collective. Optimism Collective is a sector of optimism that relies on trying to build a thriving ecosystem using the funding of public good projects to do that. So here we are talking a little bit more about optimism um, economics. So let's see how it works. Public goods, of course, are essential in our economy and Optimism is doing some great work on trying to onboard those types of projects into the blockchain space. So let's see. First of all, you have, of course, the sequencer generating revenue. So we've established so far that fees are being charged across the layer two, and those fees are being generated by the sequencer. So what Optimism will do is take a part of those revenues and deliver it to the funding of public goods. And given that the projects are actually good and they deliver value to the to the users, you should expect a higher number of users and builders to be uh, a part of this ecosystem, right? So if Optimism is able to deliver value across those projects and more users are, are using it, you should expect, expect, expect also a higher demand for the OP block space. And basically what we will be doing is increasing throughput across the, the layer two. And when you do that, more revenue is being generated. So that goes into a full cycle in which Optimism can grow their revenue and deliver great projects. So that's a huge front of Optimism's work. But you might be wondering up to now, well, Optimism is centralized, right? They work under a centralized SIGO sequencer. And yes, that is true. So let's take a look now on their roadmap towards decentralization, at least from a technological point of view. So digging through their docs, you can see how they are aiming to achieve a fully decentralized model on the, on the next years. So let's take a look at every step of it. So first of all, of course, you should build a strong community around optimism. And that's of course the first step. So in order for blockchain project, to achieve decentralization at some point, they should have a high number of users and a high number of people actually willing to build on top of the project. Once that is achieved, Optimism will release its bedrock. And this step is related to making the underlying technology of Optimism available to the public so that people can run their instances of the layer two, much like a layer one does. So when you are able to do that and you have different people running Optimism on their own, 
you are starting to move towards a more decentralized model. But that's only the, the technology being available. So optimism should also incentivize people to actually do that. And that's the third step. So given that you can run your optimism instance, why should you do that, right? So this step is related to optimism's efforts to actually incentivize people to run their instances of optimism. And given that they are able to do that, we arrive at number four, in which you can actually create a multi-client system of proof contracts. So if you have different instances of optimism running across a network, you have no more single point of failure. And once you do that, you are able to actually decentralize the proof, the proof contracts being delivered to, to the network. So that will be a huge milestone in which now we are actually talking about a decentralized model with no single point of failure that people can actually rely on. And given that this is secure and this, and this is reliable, we arrive at the final step in which Optimism will be able to achieve a fully decentralized model and decentralize the sequencers and there will be no more usage of upgrade keys. So as of today, layer twos are still complex and they require an upgrade key in which the development team can pretty much change everything they want around the project as they want. So given that you are able to achieve all of those steps and actually build a decentralized model of sequencers of challengers and people running their own copy of optimism, there will be no more need for an upgrade key because there will be no more single point of failure. So that's the technological roadmap for optimism to achieve decentralization. But hey, even if you have a technological underlying architecture that allows a decentralized network to be built, you still need the economic incentives behind it so that people are interested in actually providing the work of a sequencer, for example, or providing the work of a challenger. So let's see now the economic challenges that Optimism should face while trying to decentralize their network. So of course, more centralization means more risk. So here I brought to you three main fronts we should expect some challenges on, some economic challenges on when we think about decentralizing the whole ecosystem. So the first one, of course, is about users and the ecosystem itself. So in order for a project to, to grow in decentralization, they should have a high number of users interested in, in using the protocol and you should have a strong economy built around it. You should have a lot of money applied to the protocol. So that, of course, will be the first step. Things will get trickier when we think about the sequencers and the challengers. So, hey, let's say, for example, that Optimism is able to deliver that their technological roadmap and sequencers and challengers can be decentralized. In this case, why should people actually want to be a sequencer and a challenger for Optimism? Why won't they just take their time and work for another project? So let's take a look at what is standard on that end as of today. So usually the, the sequencers are compensated by fees being generated and they are subject to slashing. So we mentioned that today Optimism has only one sequencer and he is capturing all of the fees. But under a decentralized model, the fees will be divided across a network of sequencers. So they have this uh, recurring revenue in which they are incentivized to provide their work and they are also incentivized to work with honesty because they be, can be slashed. So usually to provide the work of a sequencer, you have to create that position. And if you are misbehaving, you can lose it all. But as for the challengers, usually they are compensated by the slashing rewards. Hey, imagine for example that you are a challenger and you are investing your time in being a challenger and you have no guarantee that you will actually be able to find a sequencer that is lying. So what's my motivation to keep doing this work? After all, sequencers are incentivized to work with honesty. So I might not found any sequencer lying <laughs> during my journey as a challenger. So that so here you create an economic problem for building a decentralized network of challengers. There are some some obvious solutions you can think about. You can just take the fees and divide for both of them so that both the sequencers and the challengers are being compensated by it. But here you create another problem of diluting everything and ultimately making it not, not uh, appealing enough 
so that they can do their work. So the truth is, yes, optimism can deliver a technological roadmap to decentralize their architecture, but the path to decentralization is also an economic problem still waiting for a viable solution. So we don't have today a robust economic model in which we can decentralize sequencers and challengers and make sure that they are interested to work for a layer two and to actually grow this decentralized network in which instances of sequencers and instances of challengers are working together and are able to operate together on the context of a network. And that's what we want. So we should uh, keep that in mind and it will be interesting to see how optimism will approach this problem on the next years. So arriving at the end of our presentation, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about other risks you may expect when you think about optimism. So the first one are the competitors, of course. So layer twos are a hot topic now on, on the crypto space. So other optimistic layer twos are being built every day so optimism has a lot of competitors. Also, another fancy type of technology that is being used across rollup projects are called ZQ rollups, and they are often regarded as a superior type of technology. And optimism actually acknowledges that, and in their docs, they say that they see ZQ rollups as a potential client under their multi-client system in the future. Another risk is about tokenomics. So today, roughly 25% of OP tokens are in circulation. So optimism should be able to continue to grow their revenue and build a thriving economy so that inflation won't be such a problem for holders in the future. And the last one is about utility. So it is commonly difficult for layer two tokens to grow in utility because the, ch the fees are being charged with the layer one token. Optimism's clever solution to that is built around, of course, both the Optimism Collective and their cycle of revenue and the decentralization of sequencers and challengers so that we can better distribute those revenue across holders. But hey, we arrived at the end of our presentation. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ping me on my social medias. And if you have any other suggestions, I'd love to know. So please let me know. Bye-bye, see you in the next video.